Hi, everybody. Good morning. This is Austin with Fantasy Baseball on Deck. And uh, opening day is a uh, an opportunity to sure up and answer a lot of questions. And uh, I did have a lot of questions coming into opening day because, you know, it seems like spring train is kind of a front, a uh, strategic front, per se, um, of figuring out kind of like where people are going to play. Um, and, you know, there's lots of meaningful context questions answered, significant um injured list moves. And then, um, you know, I'm going to go over sort of the uh, like corresponding free pickups. I think that'll be important. And even maybe some trade record, we'll go over also some trade recommendations. I'm exhausted. I, was, I almost did this video last night at like 2 AM. I just decided that I wasn't going to be able to speak anything coherently, uh, in a way that would make sense. So let's just dive right into it. Um, MLB TV. I watch this. This is kind of how I, again, um, get all of my information. I just watch baseball, all day long, um, all night long. I just have it on uh, between these four screens or these four, you know, uh, segmented screens and then a TV that's right there. Um, I have five games going at all times. And just like anything, practice makes perfect if you, or, and or if you're just uh, engulfed into um, sort of the, uh, the environment. If you're always watching baseball, you're always making sure, you know, you're always reading in between the lines. You're picking up uh, information that's valuable that, uh, you know, you'll never be able to uh, grasp through a box score. I've had MLB TV since um, I was in college, essentially. And uh, it's the best, <laughs> it's the best hundred bucks I've ever spent. They're not paying me to say that, uh, but you know, obviously it gives me an edge on um, everything fantasy baseball. I think it might be free right now. I'm not going to click into my settings and, uh, and, and jinx it sort of thing, but I haven't received a bill. And I know that like with all of the, um, you know, the TV providers kind of fighting each other uh, it, for this period, like they don't have any contracts in place. Valley sports just declared bankruptcy and all these things. Um, so I think it's very, very possible that uh, it might just literally be free right now. They're still blacking out um, your local channels, but um, you can also get around with that with a uh, VPN, which I always go with Express and just put, you know, load that up on a fire stick. It's like a 2 to $4, $5 uh, per month uh, subscription, but you know, it allows me to watch the Reds for and not own a cable package. So I um, want to go into um, kind of the, the beginning of all the things. If you haven't seen uh, the um, the Viking helmet for the Reds, uh, the Reds, I guess this year, whenever they're going to hit a home run, uh, whoever gets the dugout after they trot around the bases uh, is going to receive a Viking helmet. And uh, this is what it looked like. That is slugged deep left center. And yes, that sure was a Viking helmet. Um, but anyways, uh, what I things that I just wanted to go over, very, very quick observations um, throughout the day that I thought were important. If you're in a categories league that sort of measures like just quality starts, um, strikeouts, um, you know, the, the things that don't necessarily, you don't get penalized for uh, or like rewarded or penalized for wins and losses. Uh, yesterday, uh Mitch Keller actually he only threw four innings. We had eight strikeouts, which is a huge, you know, like the, a lot of strikeouts in comparison to what he uh, has done throughout the, you know, the, the earlier in his career. He's uh, it la the last 120 innings pitched that he threw this past season. He had a 3.22 ERA uh, with just under that uh, K per nine that we're looking for. Uh, that's the update with for Mitch Keller. If we go to uh, the Baltimore Orioles lineup, um, there's only one turtle in this lineup and it's Anthony Santadar. Other than that, like they're a pretty fast bunch yesterday. They threw, they stole five bases. So if you get a huge bonus uh, for stolen bases in my one league, I get four points per stolen base. It seems like uh, the Baltimore Orioles um, are going to be running amidst on the base pass. Jorge Mateo himself had two stolen bases last year. He was a gold glove winner um, this past year at shortstop. It seems like he's going to play every day. If you are uh, also in a categories league that need uh, stolen bases, you just completely disregarded that category might be a uh, a very low ball um you know low effort option kind of thing if we go to the philadelphia phillies 
Uh, Philadelphia Phillies, uh, Derek Hall did hit the four spot, which is really cool. And that's expected. And also it's really important that make sure that he, he absolutely slotted in at first base uh, to just make sure that that uh, he's not relying on DH spots. Cause when Bryce Harper comes back in a, you know, a month or two, three months, whatever he comes back, we just want to make sure that like Derek Hall really is locking down that first base slot. Uh, and that there are any um, you know, backups on th- this roster that could take over, uh, um, take over that position. Uh, Josh Harrison's usually been between second base and the outfield. And then Edmund and Muno Sosa has always played the left side of the infield. So he's always been a, a shortstop second base. And he even had two appearances in the outfield last year. So it seems like Derek Hall, regardless of if there's a right hand handed or left handed pitcher on the mound that he is going to be, um, the guy at first base, I don't know what, like what it'll mean when a left-hander is on the mound uh, pitching to him because he's left-handed, but he faced against Jacob DeGrom yesterday as a right-hander, and he earned the fourth spot. So uh, something to keep your eye on uh, moving forward. But first base is super shallow this year uh, or top-heavy. And, uh, you know, if you didn't end up getting one, Derek Hall might be a really, really cheap uh, value option um, as a guy who, uh, you know, was like a 30 30- home run pace uh, with limited at bats this past season. So we're trying to make this quick moving through. Um, if we go to uh, Texas Rangers, the only thing I wanted to say about uh, the Texas Rangers, I learned a fact uh, just listening to again, commentary yesterday that Corey Seager this past season, he had a, a 245 ERA or two, 245 batting average, uh, but he was actually affected by the shift the most of anyone in baseball this past season with a, uh, a certain accumulated number of at bats. Um, so the shift specific, like the shift rule specifically, I guess that the way they measure it, they're still going to shift him as much as they're allowed to. Um, but last season, due to the shift, he lost more, again, more hits than anyone in baseball. His average would have been a 287 instead of a 245. So um, Corey Seager, is, I think, you know, I've been hearing that yesterday is going to be even more valuable um, than he was last year. It's just a matter of, with, with me and him of him staying on the field and staying healthy. And that's kind of the story with seems like most MLB pitchers. Uh, James Altman uh, last night was one of my biggest revelations or at least uh, um, kind of learning uh, opportunities uh, in uh, really the LA Dodgers, Arizona Diamondbacks game. There is uh, lots of things to learn. So this is probably the most important part of this video. Uh, James Altman, 25 years old. He's the number nine prospect in the uh, Dodgers organization. So not overall, but in their organization and his 2022 stats were wild. So uh, only a- across 125 games last year, across the obviously AAA and AA, he had a uh, 978 OPS, which is on base plus slugging. Uh, he had 31 home runs, 106 RBIs, 13 stolen bases, 100 runs scored, which is wild. But I think the extra context that's really, really important here is that he is the only guy on this roster that plays outfield who's not old. So it, when I say old... And if you have any 32 year olds out there, please understand where I'm coming from, because that is not uh, old in regards to uh, just existing on the planet. But if we're trying to roam center field, which is uh, a very, very hard thing to do, like James Altman, he hit the eight spot last or last night and started was announced to be uh, he's going to be like kind of the everyday regular center fielder. Now um, Chris Taylor clearly has uh, taken a bench spot. They expect him to be a platoon role and expected to uh, have to take more shortstop reps now that um gavin lux got hurt it tore his acl before the season started so if we look across this roster and center field obviously being super duper important from a defensive perspective you've got miguel or not sorry you've got D- david peralta at 35 years old jd martinez who does not play outfield anymore he's strictly a dh um mookie betts who is uh you know the youngest of all of them but he is very much a right fielder and he's won a gold glove very very good arm and right field he's like he is best like specific specifically a very good right fielder and is expected to take more second base reps again with a gavin lux going up going um out and having to like you know shift people around so um and then if we look at his uh his competition on the bench it's 32 year old chris taylor uh, Jason Hayward, who retired and then unretired at 33 years old, and Trace Thompson at 32 years old. So it seems like, you know, if we're looking for youth uh, speed to roam the center field to really like lock down that defensive position that's so, so important, it seems like James Allen is going to play every day. And on top of that, his spring uh, this year, he hit uh, 462 at a 462 average. And uh, when you watch 
these teams let go of kind of like their centerpieces. Like we see uh, the Houston Astros let Carlos Correa leave and everybody's like, Oh, why would they do that? They have plenty of money. It's like, Oh, there's someone coming up that's going to fill in. That's going to do a very good job. Jeremy Pena coming in as a rookie and playing every day, uh, being very good defensively and offensively. It's like, okay. You have to anticipate these sort of things. So when we see Cody Bellinger leave and relatively not, get signed for that much money, $17 million in Chicago uh, at, while in LA, that's nothing to them. Why are they letting Chris or Car- Cody Bellinger leave as, as a gold glove uh, center field? Obviously his bat fell apart. He was an MVP because he was offensively great and defensively great, but he was, he's been a gold glove defender, um, you know, since he's kind of fallen apart at the plate, but you know, he's in the lineup every day because he's his defensive prowess. They let him go out the door. It's because James Outman is uh, plenty capable to take over that position. So that is probably the most important thing um, that it, of this entire video, but there's a lot of uh, <laughs> cool things and observations, obviously from here on out. So James Outman, um, I've already added him in a couple leagues. I am keep your eyes close, add him to your, uh, your, your watch list. Just keep an eye on him. He hit a home run and a double yesterday. Uh, so yeah, seems like the going to be the youth out youthful outfield that plays every day going to Arizona, which I was, uh, super pumped, like flabbergasted that, uh, actually yesterday, and this is already not in order or in date, but yesterday that man, they got to, they got to update this. Uh, Kyle Lewis was the leadoff header. Kyle Lewis was the 2020 rookie, uh, AL rookie of the year with the Seattle Mariners. They have him as a bench spot right now. Uh, and maybe it's because they're throwing, playing against a right-handed pitcher today. They haven't released the lineup. Um, obviously I don't even know if they're playing today for say, but like yesterday, uh, the observation was Kyle Lewis was leading off as traditionally a power hitter and his stats in spring were wild. Obviously I don't put a lot of, uh, uh, weight into uh, spring uh, headlines and and stats, but his stats across the spring uh, was a 4.29 average, a 5.29 on base percentage, percentage, 8.57 slugging percentage. He had three home runs, three doubles across only 34 plate appearances. So the fact that he on opening day, Kyle Lewis in the DH spot was in the leadoff spot, um, was very, very promising. Obviously, that's somebody else that you want to um, add to your uh, watch list, and that's Kyle Lewis down there. Uh, Corbin Carroll, who is expected to be that leadoff spot, actually slotted down and uh, hit the seven hole. So he has the, he's the player who has the 100th percentile sprint speed. So technically, he's the fastest player in all of Major League Baseball. Um, and he was hitting the seven spot. He was expected to be the leadoff guy. And again, that might uh, vary with, uh, different pitchers coming in, uh, left-handed or right-handed. Um, also, uh, Jake McCarthy, who was expected to be the three hole hitter. And this really kind of hit me in two leagues. Like he's been projected to be the three hole guy, um, in you know, on roster resource on fan graphs and all these different things. Uh, the whole time that he ended up hitting the nine spots that really sucks because that was a guy who stole 23 bases across just 323 or 350 at bats last year. So that was a real kick in the, uh, the Nards, but um, again, like expect uh, uh, Jake McCarthy to maybe hit the three hole versus uh, right-handed pitching. If they faced left-handed pitching yesterday, I don't remember who, what you Julio Urias is. I feel like he's a right-hander, but um, who knows? And then uh, Lourdes Guriel uh, hit the three hole yesterday. So um, he's one of the goofiest. I, I don't know what to think of Lourdes Gurriel. He'll literally like, he'll have a season where he's healthy enough to hit like a on pay on pace for like 50 home runs in a season. And then last year he was relatively healthy the entire year and hit five home runs uh, across almost 600 at bats. So you just never know what to expect out of him, but he actually got first base reps all throughout spring. Um, and then yesterday he started the three hole and then uh, played in the outfield. So um, that is a, the, the wrap on the Arizona Diamondbacks and kind of what I learned from them. Uh, the Chicago White Sox. <clears throat> I just thought it was extra cool that if they finally, finally let go of Jose Abreu, they should have traded him um, at more of a peak value. Um, but I get that he's been a stable there for a long time. But I liked the fact that and this is this is not right either. Like literally, like I go to sleep and all of the, the rosters revert back to what they were. But Andrew Vaughn hit the number three spot. Um, last night, uh, which I thought was super cool. He's been kind of like a more an average overpower guy, but it's been you know, obviously a super young man at the age of now, now 25 years old, just had a birthday. 
So uh, the fact that as a 23 and 24 year old, he's been a, kind of a 290, 280, 290 hitter uh, throughout his career. The fact that he opened up uh, as the number three hitter in Chicago at that at that that first base has outfield eligibility um, spot, I thought was really really cool and uh, something to be aware of. The uh, maybe a negative, uh, all positives here. Uh, Kendall Graveman. Um, was the setup man yesterday. So uh, Kendall Gra- Graven came in in the eighth inning um, to face the eight, nine, and one hitter. So uh, the bottom of the barrel and then um, Jeremy Pena to uh, start off, like to, to start the top of the order um, in the eighth. And then the ninth, they actually gave the ball to Ronaldo Lopez. And Ronaldo Lopez faced the two, he faced five hitters, so he faced the uh, two through six, and he ran into um, uh, Bregman. You know, uh, he gave up a solo home run to Jordan Alvarez. He walked Kyle Tucker, but it seems like uh, wh- whatever he went through the like the murderer's row of that lineup and uh, and earned the save yesterday, which I thought was uh, very very. Uh, insightful and helpful. And he's owned in like 2% or 4% of leagues uh, across ESPN. I'm sure it's the same with all of the other uh, formats in case you play on Fantrax or Yahoo or CBS or any of those other um, websites. So let's go to the next set of observations. And hopefully it's Houston Astros. Okay. So <clears throat> my only thought with uh, or thought that I wanted to talk about with the Houston Astros is I don't understand why they kind of penalized Kyle Tucker yesterday. He, he batted the five hole again. So um, this is their correct lineup yesterday. It went Jeremy Pena, Bregman, Alvarez, Abreu, Kyle Tucker. And before the season, when they were at full strength, when they had Jose Altuve and Michael Brantley um, in the lineup, they, Lock in Jose Altuve at the one spot. They announced that Michael Brantley, whenever he is in the lineup because of his like contact and average, is going to hit the two no matter what, which kind of like demeaned Jeremy Payne's value in the beginning. But what that does is just automatically pushes Kyle De- cut Tucker down to the sixth spot. And like the fact that Kyle Tucker is a top 10 player, like pre-ranked top 10 player, he's really good. I have nothing against Kyle Tucker. My only thing against Kyle Tucker is that like that he just doesn't get put in a primary spot in the lineup where he deserves. He is the healthiest of all their options. He has the, uh, Jordan Alvarez has the highest upside, but if you combine the availability and production and, you know, again, like health, health available ability kind of thing, like he's the most valuable guy out of all their position players. And he gets slotted in at the five spot on opening day. When they're at full strength, he's going to slot down to the six spot. And it's just one of those things where like, He's really productive, but at, at a six hole for your like your for maybe your first pick overall. If you can find a team who doesn't have hardly any outfield depth, um, you know, or you have you yourself have Kyle Tucker and your outfield is very very strong, I would consider trading him now uh, before you know <laughs> before it comes more of a problem and prevalent error. Yeah, you know, uh, the optics become more obvious that he's just not going to get as much production because there's just not any help behind him kind of thing. He needs to be in this three hole hitter, a three hole spot. He deserves it. I just don't know why they're not putting him, putting him there. But yeah, you know, this is something that you can sort of, um, you know, again, be ahead of and sort of anticipate. He has a ton of perceived value right now, uh, but and actual value, but like the spot in batting order is going to uh, handicap them. So uh, moving on to Miami, the only thing I wanted to say with Miami uh, and the Marlins is that uh, Jazz Chisholm actually ended up hitting the four spot yesterday. So um, I thought that was uh, important for two reasons. I didn't want him to be right. I thought that he was going to move the two and uh, I, I didn't want him to be right behind Luis Urez because Luis Urez is getting on base so often. Um, I didn't want Jazz to come up and then also get a hit and then be stuck behind Luis and not be able to steal. <laughs> so he's got Luis to get on base, you know, three spots ahead of him at the one spot. And then between uh, Jan, Gene Segura and, Garrett Cooper, who are you know, at this point being phased out of the league, I, the fact that they're the, they could only hit the two and the three hole in Miami. Um, you know, those sort of those players are going to maybe move again, Luis Urias further down the base pass so that uh, Jazz is not only um, going to have a, play, a runner, more likely have runners in scoring positions, he's going to have more RBIs, but also 
he's going to have that open, uh, you know, uh, open first base or that open second base to steal once he gets on uh, first more often. Then also right behind Jazz in this lineup between Jorge Soler, Garcia, De La Cruz, that's all their power, those power guys with just not super high averages. So when he is getting on, he's moving around the base pass, like he's going to have their, like their hammers actually at the bottom of that lineup to get him in for those uh, bonus run scores that we can't really predict. So uh, good, good news, good on the news front with Jazz Chisholm, even though, he had a little bit of a rough day at the plate yesterday. Um, St. Louis Cardinals in Toronto game was awesome yesterday. If you didn't see it um, back and forth, back and forth. Uh, I think it was like the final score was like 10 to 11 or something like that. But uh, the observation of this uh, St. Louis game is that uh, there's so many good players that are just not going to be able to, um, you know, get see playing time. So Dylan Carlson actually ended up getting benched. Juan Yepes ended up getting uh, option to triple A, even though he's a really quality player, like between the first base, third base and outfield position, he would get playing time at just about any other team, but their outfield is stacked. Like there's no, uh, nowhere to breathe kind of thing. So I thought that it was important just to say that uh, Brennan Donovan um, hit the leadoff spot. It was going to be between him and Tommy Edmond. Tommy Edmond obviously has the uh, more of an outlook on like stolen bases and things. Brandon Donovan's an on-base champ, and so is Lars Newtbar. But uh, at least with a right-handed pitcher, um, you know, coming up yesterday, Tommy Edmonds is a switch hitter, so maybe they'll like flip flop go one nine. But uh, Brandon Donovan's uh, available in almost every league. He's eligible at every position except catcher on some. Uh, websites uh, and then the other websites like ESPN, he's eligible everywhere except for uh, like shortstop. I think, I think is the only thing he's not eligible in on ESPN, but like essentially he's eligible at every position. He, if he's going to stick here, he's going to get the most at bats on a really, really good roster. Um, you know, this is just a player to keep your eye on. I'm, I'm not buying in yet, but my brother's pushing me to add him to our keeper league. And um, there's a couple of players I think I'd rather have, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll see again. Tommy Edmund might switch to the one hole um, if they face against a left-handed uh, pitcher, but we'll see. Uh, Nolan Gorman, again, importantly moved to the DH spot. So like if it was, Gorman at second base instead of Donovan, you have to worry about Donovan getting phased out. But the fact that he got the uh, defensive start over Gorman, that might give him a, a leg up. Uh, again, I said uh, Dylan Carlson to the bench. So uh, that's important. I'm like, finally, Dylan Carlson, high draft pick, but um, you know, needed needs to needs to be there on the bench. That's where he belongs, at least for now, until he figures things out. Um, uh, with the, the Tampa Bay Rays, I wanted to just uh, very quickly say that Isaac Paredes uh, hit the three hole yesterday. So he's actually, uh, where is he at on this? Oh, he's at the seven hole uh, on this, this website. It's been so good. It was yesterday. It was like up to date. Now it's not, I don't understand, but uh, Isaac Paredes was the number three hole hitter and with Tampa Bay yesterday, Isaac Paredes last season um, across only 331 at bats. He had 20 home runs, uh, which was uh, on pace to hit like a 35 for a, for an entire season. So that was really good. And also he's eligible at first base, second base and third base on every, almost every single uh, website. So um, I might be potentially could be a very, very big value given that how young he is. And the fact, again, he's already hit as a 23 year old last year, um, you know, hit at a, uh, a 35 home run, pace again so they don't have a ton of power on that lineup he deserves to be in the top four um if he can get his average to anything above 230 and we shall see about that um going to seattle um as expected like i've said this this whole offseason to completely disregard paul seawald um he is the veteran guy uh like that has closing experience but he's not the best guy for the job andres munoz at 24 years old is already signed an extension there's no need to like keep him from that closer role so that they can save a little money in the future he's already going to be there his contract is like a set so like between the two like who's just the more like you know athletic who is the more capable talented individual and it's andres Andre Andres Munoz every single time. Andres Munoz earned the save yesterday over Paul Seawald. Um, Paul Seawald actually got the win um, for or the win of the hold uh, in the at the very end of that game. Um, so again, Andres Munoz 
uh, was drafted much lower. He's owned in less less percentage percentage of leagues. If you have Paul Sewald, try to trade him for anything because he did get like either that win or that hold yesterday. And again, I forgot I watched the game, but I saw so much base. I got thirteen hour, twelve thirteen hours of baseball. Uh, you're, you're gonna forget some things. Anyways, um, so maybe if you can try to trade away Sewald while you can before it really gets discovered and understood that he's going to be the setup guy moving forward. And the one. That I was most upset about is that uh, Oscar Gonzalez didn't start yesterday uh, for whatever reason. Maybe it was just because the uh, the matchup wasn't right. Like he, you know, he is a right-handed hitter. He was coming up against another right-handed pitcher in Luis Castillo yesterday. But uh, you know, he hit 296 last year. Played every day at the end of the season. Um, you know, the final 91 games of the season was like pretty uh, solid. Had a game-winning home run in the playoffs. Um, I don't, I, I am baffled. This was a player that I had bolded green scion, like had to walk away with. I have him in almost every league. And um, I just couldn't believe that he didn't make the start yesterday. So my hope is, is that something comes out and basically says like, oh, he had like a stomach bug, um, seafood poisoning. I don't know, something goofy to keep him on the lineup. Cause he had seemed like he has all of the upside. There's not the, the player that replaced him um, in that roster. Uh, yesterday who hit like the eight hole it does not have the um yeah the up uh, the upside per, per se the oscar gonzalez does so uh, that was really frustrating but um yeah i'm just hoping that you know, again where they play again today and we will hope that uh you know he slots back in the roster and like again they just say it was like a head cold or something stupid on to san diego and the update with san diego only is that they are throwing out like their like cookie cutter uh, offense of what it will look like with Fernando Tatis Jr. in it. They announced that Fernando is going to be the leadoff hitter. Uh, Trent Grisham's just going to slot down to the nine like he's always been before. So it's like literally going to be, you can expect the lineup to be Fernando Tatis, Soto, Machado, Bogarts, Cronenworth. Um, I don't know why, again, like that they don't put Bogarts as a leadoff hitter. Everything about Bogarts makes uh, makes him a leadoff hitter at this point in his career. But, um, you know, they probably want Tatis to you know, give him the freedom to be able to run the bases and things. So, uh, you know, I just think that that, again, that was a very, very clear, like good optics. Um, you know, after two weeks of waiting, someone might not have or be patient enough to hold on to Tatis for another week or so. If they're like starting off the season, Oh, and two or over three, you might be able to get them uh, for a discount, but something to just sort of, uh, again, keep your eyes on as we move forward through the season, Colorado, um, CJ Crohn did it again. He had four hits. Two of them were home runs and he had five RBIs uh, yesterday. And he starts out the season every single year on absolute fire. He does this every single season. So uh, at a first base position that not a lot of people have, he probably even has uh, outfield eligibility as well in your league. He may or may not. But uh, I think this is like after the first game of the season, if people are, are gullible enough, I think this is an opportunity to trade that player because he just doesn't have the uh, capabilities to finish really inside of the top eight. Um, a, so I would think that like CJ Crone, again, solid trade piece, 33 years old, Colorado is his best friend with the environment, but, uh, the lineup around him, I just don't have a ton of, uh, a ton of faith in. and on to the next set of tabs. And I should be talking about, I should be talking about the Mets. I should be talking about the Mets. I don't see the Mets. Because I am a goofball who doesn't – gosh darn it. Sorry, everybody. Um, I'm going to talk about the Mets. Uh, let's just say that uh, J- um, Justin Verlander got sent to the IL. Glad that he was highlighted red. Do not draft because you don't trust someone who's in their 40s in the top 10, top 15 picks. Doesn't make sense. But anyways, if you did that – um. No worries per se, because I think that I have a lot of faith in David Peterson. So David Peterson now is locked in to uh, be in that um, be in that rotation, not only in that rotation, but he's going to be um, it, starting the second game actually today. Um, Peterson had really good stats last year. He had three, like a 389, 386, something like that uh, ERA. He had 20 more strikeouts than innings pitched. Um, and across only just over a hundred innings pitched last season. So the fact that like, if you, if you multiply that by, you know, 1.8 or so uh, to get him to like a full year's worth of work, I mean, that seems like he's going to be a 200 uh, possible 200 strikeout pitcher, which means 
all of the difference. Um, a very young guy, 27 years old, seems like that's kind of like the prime for pitchers to at least be uh, released and kind of like let go from an innings pitch perspective. Last year as a 26 year old, I got transitioned to the bullpen even after being very successful. Uh, <laughs> um, so David Peterson seems like a pretty solid option to slot in at the, um, at the pitcher position. And then if you go to uh, the, the Braves, the Braves with uh, they're going to open up the season with their number one um, overall prospect and Jared Schuster as kind of seems like more of a lock to move on through the season has that number five slot when they're at their um, at their strongest, but then also their number 10 uh, prospect overall Dylan Dodd is going to get the op- opportunity to um, as a rookie is going to get an opportunity to fill uh, that that five at in the short term while Kyle Wright is on the IL with uh, minor shoulder issues. So if you can, uh, if you need a pitcher, if you're looking for someone to uh, fill a value role for a short term, then uh, Dylan Dodd seems like a, a possible flyer, but it seems like Jared Schuster is more of a, a long term sustainable option with uh and then also like max free just got hurt that's why i brought up dylan Dodd. max free just strained his hamstring um so uh yeah that's that's the update on that um going down to los angeles this just wanted to make a note that uh taylor ward is still uh the leadoff hitter for los angeles and he was 28th in on-base percentage last year, um, hit 23 home runs and just less than 500 at bats. So as long as he can stay healthy, he's going to be great. He stole a base last year or last night uh, with, you know, the regulars, Trout, Otani, Rendon, Renfro, lot, lots of power behind him. So, so a reminder that Taylor Ward um, is doing great. Um, and then also like the last team observation that I will uh, mention is that Oakland has a very murky closer situation. Uh, it seemed yesterday that um, of all of the suitors that Danny Jimenez actually um, was the uh, the one in a very close game with Los Angeles only up uh, by one run. It seems like Danny Jimenez is going to be uh, maybe that first and primary option for the closer position. Uh, and to earn saves throughout the year for an Oakland team that when they do win games, they're going to be close. And then uh, the, I want to go and just make a, a mention of, uh, you know, these five players you're looking at are, are all all-stars essentially. Um, and they all got lit up yesterday. It's not because they're, they're bad. Do not trade your pitchers. Do not drop your pitchers. Uh, th- at this point in the season, after one start everywhere was cold yesterday. We talked about this last year, like pitching is so much about uh, gripping your fingers into the ball and like really like manipulating it the way that you need to, to get that spin, to get it right. In the, the a pocket that's this big, like this much variance on either side. So just make sure do not lose faith in your pitchers this early, but also at the same time, uh, make sure that you're not using your waiver claims because other people in your league and other people all the time will drop their high, high invested, high invested pitchers uh, for very, very poor reasons because they had one or bad, one bad outing to start the year. And, uh, you know, that's opportunity for you to make huge advances. I, I mentioned last year about how after the first two starts, Framber Valdez, who ended up being a top 15 you know, performer across all, all different formats, uh, was dropped. And I just didn't have a high enough waiver claim because the year hadn't passed on um, long enough. I was at like number three and the number one waiver claim claimed them and um, kept them for, you know, the rest of the year. I ended up trading for him and getting them back. But uh, uh, anyways, like just keep your waiver claims. Don't drop your pitchers. Don't uh, don't waste your claim on like non people like this. And then also uh, if people are like uh, pitchers, these same kind of types of pitchers, caliber pitchers start off really poor. Uh, make sure that you are, um, you know, just kind of on the uh, trade alert awareness uh, sort of thing of like just kind of sort of text these people and say, hey, um, you know, Aaron Nola, Jacob Grom, whatever, kind of fell apart yesterday. Uh, what do you think about him? And they'll say like, ah, oh, just man, I'm, they're really frustrating me. And also I kind of need like second baseman. I didn't like get a second baseman. I'd be considering, I would consider moving away from one of the best pitchers in all of major league baseball for like a middle grade, like B grade, a minus grade second baseman. And you do that deal every time marginal improvements all throughout the year uh, that are this big, make 20 of them become let's say this big. Uh, so just a reminder of that. And also uh, this is the only thing I wanted to say was uh, I literally had it loaded. This is what you do at uh, so-and-so in the morning. Um, 
This is Hunter Renfro's catch. I saw this just in the corner of my eye uh, last night. I'm sure it's already on Sports Center. It was on Sports Center like two seconds after it happened. Uh, it's at ESPN here, and then yeah, you know, all the games on my other like monitor here. And uh, Hunter Renfro made like you know one of the luckier catches I've ever seen. But I thought it would be entertaining at least to uh, to see from your from you know you guys see from your eyes. Just blindly. Thought that was entertaining. So that's the end of the show today. Uh, that was over my observations uh, of, you know, what opening day was. Open day was really, really fun. I'm glad that you guys all uh, maybe enjoyed it as much as I did. Hopefully you slept a little more than I did. But um, these are the things you got to do uh, when you want to uh, make it in the fantasy baseball analysis world sort of thing. So anyways, uh, thank you for your time and talk to you soon. Bye.